Good evening. How many are there so far? Because, yes. Uh, uh, Ramakant, we are live. Over to you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so after a good uh, IAS con uh, uh, meeting uh, in uh, September, so we are restarting with our monthly meeting of IAS Academic Corner. So this session will be moderated by uh, Dr. Pratap sir and Dr. Vinay Pandey. Uh, and uh, we'll have uh, expert talk and two case presentations. So to continue with uh, uh, Dr. Pratap sir and uh, Dr. Vinay. Good evening. Um, Vinay, you are there? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. Sir. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, hi, Ashish. Hi. Hi. And uh, all, the, all the two presenters, uh, Shivam and uh, Karan uh, Kakeja. Uh, for presentation and um, uh, thank you uh, IAS Academy uh, for uh, conducting this meeting and we've got a very interesting cases. Uh, um, <clears throat> we are going to have an excellent faculty talk, uh, very simple, I know he's going to keep it very simple but understanding, you know, people can understand step by step and uh, we can start it uh, on time. Uh, Vinay, you want to uh, share anything? Yeah, that's fine, sir. I think we can proceed. We, uh, we should yeah. proceed. Okay, to over to... Over to uh, um, Ashish, please, and we will we will mute our ours. Okay. Everyone else, please mute. mute. Ashish, over to you. Hi. Yes. Good evening. Nice uh, to meet all of you, and uh, very pleased to be part of this IS uh, webinar. And uh, it's a pleasure to attend this. Uh, just allow me to share this. And there are some new stuff here. One sec. There's a Zoom upgrade, so it's asking me for my password and everything. Sir, please upgrade it and give permissions. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I don't. <laughs> this is new. I didn't realize because I've been using this for a long time and I hope this works now. Yeah, I, I think I got it. Yeah. It's funny. It's strange. Is my... Is my screen live? Super, super. Thank you, Sandeep, Sundar, uh, IPS, uh, Pratap. Uh, let me, without uh, delay, start with an algorithm for shoulder instability. It's a concise algorithm. Within 15 minutes, I'll get you all the essentials without the riffraff so that it's very clear to all the uh, attendees. So number one is your patient selection. Uh, that is very critical. And more than indications, I think what is important is which patient not to do. So uh, we know most of our patients, 90% uh, are clear-cut traumatic bank card patients, and they will do well. It is that 10% where we can go wrong. So certainly, I would never operate a multidirectional instability because that's a different breed of patient. The uncontrolled epileptic is a big challenge. Uh, secondary gain, I don't think we have a problem. And then there's in between gray zone where you've got a patient who says, I've been dislocated 100 times, feel free to do what you want, I will handle the rest. Or the rebel or the athlete, he, sir, you operate me, I will show you how to get into the Olympics within two months. That doesn't happen. The athlete is a major challenge. You could do the best bank card repair and he may not be able to get back to the original level. And we can discuss this at length after the presentation. The females, I said, is because go back and think when was the last time you had to operate a female dislocator. They are extremely rare. There's something happening there. It is not your conventional traumatic uh, dislocation. So do be careful on those patients. Ligament laxity is rife. It is prevalent. It is seen in most of our Asian patients. You would think it's that young female patient, but I see almost 25% of my male patients. If that patient is a wrestler or a boxer and has ligament laxity, boy, both of us are in trouble. This is a young patient. You can see we're doing the crank jobs. And moment I release the hand, he is very apprehensive. You can see it on his face. It's a crank and jobs test. And you need to watch the face of the patient when you're doing this. So if this test like you saw here is not a conventional crank and jobs. It's a mid-range instability. So it's been done in 40 degrees. When it is positive in 40 degrees, it is highly likely that this patient has a glenoid bone loss. So if I do an MRI and especially a 
typical orthodox 1.5 Tesla or a one Tesla MRI, I'm going to miss out on the real deal. So in these patients, you must insist on doing a CT scan. So imaging X-ray standard, my preferred series is True AP and Strachonotu. Occasionally, I would get an actual. These three are the most useful X-rays. Rule number one, I would never do an MRI without doing an X-ray. And I see too many patients coming from outside who just come with an MRI and think that they have done. What information I get from an X-ray is immeasurable. So I must, as a rule, and this is the basic. It's like no patient undergoes a 2D echo without having an ECG done. My preference for MRI is 3T. I don't do contrast MRI since 2007. I don't do other protocols from around the same time. It's a waste of time. They don't add to any information, add risk to the problem. If you give me a choice between an MRI CT, I would prefer a CT, but most of our MRIs that are at risk, our radiologist has an understanding that if he thinks there's any semblance of bone loss, he would do a complementary CT for them straight away. So that is important. You must understand this. Now, this is very straightforward. Looks like a true AP. You must have a true AP. And the figure on your left, you can see here what is happening here. And here, you can see that there is a nice double cortical line here. Whereas on the right side, you will see that there is a complete loss of double cortical sign. This is a complete giveaway. And this is highly likely for a 15 to 20% glenoid bone loss just on an X-ray. So if you do a correct X-ray, you would know which patient to send for a CT. And this sign has been described by Tamai back in 1992. It was reinvented by Christian Gerber and Jan Koskas in 2010. Now, we do a fair bit of non-operative. All my first-time dislocators who are middle-aged, about 20. My undisclosed bony bank cards who are monitored. Elderly, more than 40 first-time dislocators, second-time dislocators. I would, without dispute, treat them conservatively. About my patient with axillary neuropathy, I need to be careful. I don't have a solution for this. I some of them I operate early, some of them I operate later. We'll debate about that later. And the uncontrolled epileptic, these are relative contraindications. I would prefer not to operate personally. Craig Botoni and there are several others who have made a big push for operating the first time dislocators. But a word of caution here, if you've uh, read the Swedish study of the 250 patients that were done, uh, if you operate every patient of shoulder instability, you're operating 50% unnecessary patients. So unless it's a high risk, unless it's an athlete, unless it's a patient younger than 20, those are my three indications or a displaced bony banker are for the first time dislocator. Now, how soon after recent dislocation do I operate? About two to three weeks. I never operate within the first week of surgery. Uh, not relevant. Uh, don't rush it in. You burn your hands. Axial nerve injury, I think those you need to prioritize. You don't want to delay them. And if there's a cuff tear, which is of a large size, then I would try to treat them early, but never within the first two weeks of dislocation. On the athletes, uh, it's a very different ball game. So if it's an in-season athlete, then I would treat him with rehab for that season. And then between season, I would go and operate them even at the first dislocation, without which they will not be able to pursue their uh, sport. And uh, you can do a brace, you can give them rehab, and they will manage uh, most of them. But young male is a very high risk of discipline, if, especially if he's a throwing athlete. The mid-range athletes like the wrestlers and the boxers are not so difficult. Would like to skip this side. In 21 years of my practice, I have never done a single rotator interval, or maybe one or two cases just for the surgical demo when somebody in the audience wanted us to show them how to do a rotator interval. I don't think it works. There is very little evidence that a rotator interval repair helps. When you have a bony banker, it is a different battle because even though we repair it, there is no guarantee that that bony banker will get integrated. So you have to be very, very careful and watchful. This is an elderly lady, 50 years old, just fell off the stairs. No evidence of full dislocation, but very, very apprehensive. And when you look at that x-ray, there's something funny happening here, okay? So there's a detachment. It's a very subtle finding. Moment you see this, don't do an MRI. Go and do a CT scan. This is what You need a 3D CT scan 
with subtraction of the head of humerus and a sagittal reconstruction. If you give that instruction, then you can see that there's a whopping big fragment here. And this is really risky because you will just subluxate every time. And this is the CT scan for the double row bank, bony bank repair that I have performed. And you do that almost six months after surgery to establish whether it's taken part, incorporated well, and it actually molds well. So this is another patient, another middle-aged lady. The bones are much more fragile. And you can see the double row medial anchor here and the reconstruction and the healing. They don't heal all the time. There's a high incidence of fibrous union on these. The hill sacs, there is no concept of engaging and non-engaging. They all engage. So if it's a wide hill sacs and it's a big one, then I would do it. But I do a remplissage in a company to accompany my bank card in only one third of the cases. I don't do remplissage as frequently as should be. There is some evidence from Eugene Wolf, who was the founder of the remplissage, that it works to reduce the redistribution rates. But there's enough evidence that in revision on failed bank cards, the remplissage never adds an addition. Uh, I have never done a remplissage on my Lataje patient. So you, this is Sekia's study. You would want to measure the defect in three planes the AP diameter, the superior infer diameter, and the depth. So you need uh, the uh, scans in axial, in sagittal, and in coronal planes to measure all the three depths. And then you get a hill sacs quotient, which will dictate whether I need. And that information is provided to us by a radiologist, and our fellow will double check that preoperatively. Understand the remplissage technique. Ensure this is a fantastic paper from Ilya Ilkinson. Take home very quickly is don't put them to medial. You'll make them stiff. If you position your remplissage correctly, there is no reason for any restriction in movement. And that depends on your site of anchor and depends on the bite at which point of the infraspentus capsule that you occur. I am provoked to talk about the DAS procedure because there's a lot of discussion. It's a flavor of the month right now. And it's important to understand that you reroute the biceps and insert it through the subscap and then insert it in the face of the glenoid, depending on what level you want. Usually it's the middle glenoid. It's an augment and is meant for very select indications. So if I have a glenoid bone loss, which is about 15% and there is a compromised labrum, then I would do this as an in-between procedure where I'm reluctant to do a lataje, which is too big a procedure and a bank card is not likely to work. So it can be, but it is a new baby. Long-term results are still unknown. Hopefully, it will be adequate enough to reduce our redistribution rates in this difficult sort of gray zone, which is no bone loss, labrum tear, I would do a bank card, 20% lean at bone loss, I would do a LATAR-J. And that in-between patient where there's a 10 to 20% bone loss, the DAS will significantly reduce anterior humeral transmission. This is Clara Asbedo. She's from Portugal and she has uh, several YouTube videos on the DAS procedure. She does a different technique of the uh, DAS procedure using all suture anchors and you could use that as well. The workhorse for glenoid bone loss remains the Lataje procedure, especially for contact athletes. You must have minimum two screws. The graft has to be flush. It has to be a coracoid graft because there's a three different advantages with the sling. If you're doing a Lataje, not the easiest procedure, whether you do an arthroscopic or an open Lataje, it has to be a robust procedure. It's a precision surgery. For me, both the open and arthroscopic Latages are very challenging procedures. I, my stress levels are high. I have to be very perfect. And you, the X-ray doesn't tell you what has happened. You need a post-op CT scan. I usually do it at between four and six months. And then you need to align your screw angles, which is the alpha angle, how flush the graft is, and whether it is indicated in integrated is also very important. So we've given you different tools for addressing these different patients. Uh, in conclusion, just on time, it is important to understand the deficit-based approach, whether there's bone loss, what is the quality of labrum, what level of hill sac there is. MDI patients, we prefer rehab, but identification of glenoid bone loss is important. If we have not screened them prior, then we will never be able to offer them the lethargy. So that is the most common reason for failure where one has not recognized the glenoid bone loss. And remplissage, again, is too overdone. You would reserve that for only your difficult patients where you can map the remplissage on the Sekia technique of the 
Hillsax Index. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Excellent, excellent. That 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 is the masterclass. Um, that, I enjoyed it. Um, can I ask you one question? I will start yes, with the question. Ashish. Yes. Go on. Ah, okay. Um, you and many people are, has has come down their bond loss, anterior glenoid bond loss to thirteen percent now. What is your take on that for a letter J? Right. I think that is a very important and a very pertinent question that you asked, and I'm glad you did that. Unfortunately, what happens is our training is such that every case that we do, AVM, ACL, we are tending to think of a homogeneous solution for a heterogeneous problem. So we like to look at things as black and white. 15% glenoid bone loss, do a DAS picture. 20% glenoid bone loss, do a latarge. But there is a lot of mixture there. There's a lot of gray area. So obviously, as I said, when there's no bone loss, good labrum, I would do a bank card. Anybody would do that. And when there's a 20, 25% bone loss, what about the gray area in between? I don't think we have a perfect solution. So I tailor make that. So it's a a la carte procedure. If I have a young female medical intern who's 15% bone loss, 20% bone loss, she's not the sports type, and she has a healthy labrum, I would still do a bank card and a replacement. And it still works. And I have about a good seven, eight year follow up on such level of patients. But I have a throwing athlete who has a 15% bone loss, labrum quality is poor, hill sex is large. I have no hesitation doing a latage on them. So you can stretch your indications based on a patient. All this input is very important. So you, you have to integrate all these different factors. These are the confounding variables that decide my treatment. So take up all this and then decide. The revision patient, 15% bone loss. I'm not going to do a bank card on that. I would do a latage because it's a much more predictable in my hands, no complication rate or a very low complication rate. I would do a latage on those patients. So there's Thank a question you. in the chat box. Uh, Ashish sir, there's a yes, go on, Vinay. Go on. So, uh, between inlaid DAS and onlay DAS, which one do you think is easy and a better outcome? Right, Mozamil, very sharp question. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anybody, even Alexander Ladarman, doesn't have an answer on that. But if you have been a SESI member, I we did a SESI newsletter, and Pratap and uh, uh, this fellow. The secretary distributed that newsletter. Dipit, I Dipit. took Dipit Saho, uh, distributed a newsletter. I interviewed Alexander Laderman on several questionable fa facts about the DAS procedure. I recommend you read that. If you don't have access to that, write to Pratap or me. We will share that with you. Uh, it's too uh, short. The DAS has been in fashion for a couple of years. We don't have an answer to that. The DAS that is practiced by Clara Asvedo, the DAS that done by Alex Lederman are different procedures. So it doesn't matter. We don't have a perfect answer. But there are many other op, uh, query questionable facts about the DAS. In fact, I've asked him, you must be able to compare the DAS with the Bankart remplissage, not with a bony procedure. Everybody's comparing the DAS to the Latage. It's not a fair comparison. It's orange and apples. Sir, uh, uh, an opinion uh, regarding this year's European Society for Surgery of Shoulder and Anbo had this presidential lecture by Dr. Xavier Durard, where the topic was, can bank card be saved? So in the background, the, the percentage going down from 25 to 20 to 17 to 13, and Dr. Deepak Bhatia has this 10% cutoff now. And I'm in the middle of class meeting of shoulder. There also people are moving towards more and more lethargy. So what do you think uh, bank card is dying surgery kind of, or what's your opinion? So Vinay, uh, two ways to answer that question. I will tell you my practice, and I get this question all the time because fellows visit us and they see us doing a volume latage. Arguably, we do the highest number of arthroscopic latages. My latages are still 20% of my instability work. I'm still very happy with my bank card, and people are scared about doing bank card in athletes. I can tell you, I have national wrestlers who are in the Kesri, twice gold medalists, after bank card. I have a Commonwealth athlete with a bank card cuff repair with a silver medal. So I have no hesitation. So I will stick to the algorithm. I have shared a very honest algorithm that exactly I follow, number one. Number two, the reason people do latarji are very different. You must read the writing between the lines. 
it depends on whether you are a patriot or not so if you are a south african if you are an australian and if you are a french guy you are going to do everything lataji and in fact i have worked with jody beer for 3 weeks he is very disappointed in doing a bank card and he sees 0% bone loss he is like compelled to do a bank card i have no problem with it but at the same time doing a lataji in the absence of glenard bone loss is inviting serious trouble that entire graft is going to get dissolved within 2 years those screws are going to be floating naked and they will damage the head of humerus i undo a lot of failed lataji's that come to us from outside i have recently presented some very complex cases where a young first time dislocator was operated with a lataji and he was converted from anterior instability to a posterior recurrent instability is also the fear of overdoing it. so don't worry your conviction should be science your conviction should not be a nationality terrans you got a question yeah uh, sir, sir uh, excellent presentation by the way sir now uh, sir one question this first time dislocators especially you said more than 20 you're not preferably you're not going to probably it's a non operative indication for you i would like to say do you get an mri for all these patients when they come after the after reduction of the joint smart question 100% do an mri on every dislocator or even a subluxator because the subluxator and dislocator are equally sinister one of the most important reasons that one must do an mri or a ct is because if there's a hidden bony bank card that's a big challenge because that fragment may not unite and it gets devascularized because its blood supply comes from the parent bone the avascular labrum is incapable of nutritioning that fragment you see that fragment after one and a half years and you will have seen it has dissolved it converts into a glenard bone loss and presents you as a lataje which is an overkill for such a simple patient and no harm in doing a lab, but always always do an x ray and mri on every dislocator ashish okay. kashish can i ask you one one more question yeah sure sure yeah. can we start okay. with ramakan ramakan has been oh, okay okay put oh, his hand sorry. up we'll come no, back no. to you yeah 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 uh, is so ramakan has a question in the chat box ramakan is the same question no no it's a different question sir sir uh, actually um, uh, can you tell more about the position of anchors for uh, rampless surge and best bite in the this thing can you elaborate more on that sir the surgical tips right 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 uh two things uh, we are very unorthodox in how we do our bank cards and how we mobilize them i mobilize them very early but which means that i have to do a robust repair on most of my patients so i prefer two three things number one uh always a mattress at the 6 o'clock the anchor positioning is about 5 30 4 and 2 but you don't need three anchors all the time because sometimes the labrum is missing there you don't need to do that but that 5 30 and go among i my anchors are never symmetrical i crowd them in the inferior part 5 30 and 4 and then top one goes to 2 or 130 because the instability is an anterior inferior problem so i need to crowd my anchors and do my best repair anterior inferiorly always a mattress my first mattress comes from posterior bite i always use a indirect suture shuttle no direct device no bird beak doesn't work the indirect spiral suture device will take the first bite from posterior because i would take a capsule and ijhl no labrum in that posterior bite because i need a inferior to superior shift i invest all my procedure in a inferior to superior shift pants over vest if you do a mattress from the front portal you are doing a front to back shift waste of time you have to do that pick up and i don't think there's any measure to say how much pick up so once that inferior bite has come the first which has come from there then you go through your 5 o'clock subscap portal and then take the ijhl and the labrum there then i park those two switches posteriorly in the posterior cannula then put in the 4 o'clock and then i tie the 4 o'clock first to get an x amount of shift while i'm doing that my assistant comes with a um i stand from behind and picks the labrum and pulls it up to get me an x level shift then i tie the 4 o'clock anchor i get an x plus 1 shift because my bite has started 1 cm or 2 cm below that anchor once i've tied my 4 o'clock anchor i still have another shift at 5:30 so i get an x plus 2 shift by doing that so you are investing in small small shifts in that you understand yes sir Uh, no, That's actually, question the, the ramp research, sir. Actually, I wanted to know for the ramp research uh, more on the banker. 
ரெம்ப்ளிசாஜ்ரிசாஜ்ரிசாஜ்ரிசாஜ்ரிசாஜ்ரிசாஜ்ரிசாஜ்ரிசாஜ்ரிசாஜ்ரிசாஜ்ர
Uh, are you able to see my screen, sir? Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Shivam. I will be presenting a case on ATFL reconstruction with internal bracing for chronic ankle instability. I thank Indian Arthroscopy Society and my mentor, Dr. Sundarajan sir, for the opportunity. Uh, so ATFL injury is the most common sports-related ankle injury. And up to 75% of the ankle sprains are partial or complete tears of ATFL. So anatomical repair using the Broston technique, along with the inferior extensor retinaculum augmentation, which is known as a gold procedure. The Broston gold procedure is the gold standard procedure for chronic ankle instability. But where does the controversy arise is the poor quality of the remnant tissue. Secondly, the problem of recurrence instability following modified Broston procedure, which is postulated to be as high as 25% in some of the studies and poor return to sports. So people have tried to use uh, periosteal flaps to augment it. Some people have used the hamstring grafts to augment the repair. So uh, where does the suture tape augmentation come in is of recent interest. It is postulated to protect the original repair during healing. It is postulated to give better clinical outcomes and a less cumbersome procedure. Uh, it is proven to be uh, better in case of young females, in cases of generalized ligamentous laxities, as well as in settings of revision surgeries. So my case is a 24-year-old male, history of inversion injury eight months back, complaint of recurrent ankle instability, which was managed conservatively. So uh, on evaluation, uh, there was a positive anterior drawer as well as a Taller tilt test. Uh, for radiological assessment, we take a Taller tilt angle as well as anterior Taller translation. So these stress X-rays were done with both the legs in comparative mode. So Taller tilt as well as the varus stress test were positive. So and in MRI there was an ATFL tear. So in MRI in sagittal section when the fibula becomes C shape like this as well as the tibia becomes oval shape. That is where we see the ATFL tear. So uh, this was planned for an ATFL reconstruction with internal bracing. So we always do an examination under anesthesia, which is showing instability. We do the diagnostic arthroscopy using a standard uh, anteromedial as well as anterolateral uh, portals. This is the anteromedial corner. This is the medial malleus. After this, we visualize the anterior teller edge for any hypertrophic synovium or any synovitis. I always see the teller dome for evaluation of any osteochondral defect, which was not there in this case. Secondly, on cleaning the lateral gutter, we find a very good amount of lateral opening, which is suggestive of an ATFL injury, as we can see on this case. So there is enough uh, 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 evidence that uh, ankle stabilization uh, arthroscopic versus open have a similar outcome. So uh, we do it uh, mini open. So it's a J-shaped incision, which is between the two now, an extensile approach is taken. A bump under the ankle is used and an extensile approach is taken. Uh, after superficial dissection, a capsular ligamentous incision is marked. A full thickness capsular ligamentous incision is taken over the lower end of the fibula. Upper and lower full thickness capsular ligamentous flaps are raised like this. Now the lower end of the fibula is made raw for the attachment of the distal flap. So I, uh, and for the gold modification, inferior extensor retinaculum is identified and suture bites are taken through this. We usually use two anchors in the fibula for the repair, one anterior and one posterior. This is the marking for the suture anchors. So this is the first anchor going in and the second anchor. Now uh, for the internal brace augmentation, uh, a knotless anchor in talus is loaded with a fiber tape. 
so anchor is directed in the center of the talus and is directed towards the body of the talus so here we do a superficial dissection sometimes we identify the correct point using uh, siam guidance and we insert uh, the knotless anchor which is loaded with a fiber tape this is a knotless anchor along with the fiber tape and the repair is done in a pant over waist manner in which the lower end of the flap is raised and repaired to the uh, to the fibula and secondly uh, for the gold modification bites are taken through the inferior extensor retinaculum a knotless anchor loaded with a fiber tape is placed in the fibula above the level of repaired ligament for the augmentation so this is the marking for placement of fibular knotless anchor above the level of repaired ligament so uh, fibular swivel lock angle loaded with fiber tape is pushed in and the most important step during this procedure is while tightening the artificial ligament we keep the ankle in the neutral position uh, we do not do any inversion or eversion and we put a mosquito forceps below this uh, uh, fiber tape in order to prevent over tightening so this is the final repair so this is the assessment of the final repair so we have a post operative standard protocol we put uh, patients in below knee slab for uh, in eversion for a period of 2 weeks partial weight bearing is started after 2 weeks and ankle range of motion exercises are started full weight bearing is started after 4 weeks and ankle strengthening after 4 weeks is started uh, a very uh, good assessment is of alignment which is to be done before uh, the procedure in this case there was a cavus foot along with the atfl tear so we had to do a calcaneal osteotomy in order to correct the varus and do an atfl reconstruction so the discussion is between modified rostrum gold repair versus suture tape augmentation so there are a lot of level 3 level 4 studies which compare the modified rostrum repair with and without suture tape augmentation uh, uh, so i did a systematic review of randomized control trial and which is awaiting its uh, publication and presented it in uh, ifascon Uh, so we uh, included studies which compared Brostrom gold repair with and without suture tape augmentation, which were only randomized control trials and randomized control studies. Uh, so we searched PubMed, Cochrane, as well as Google Scholar, and identified five studies which were uh, level one or level two evidence studies, and we did a. a systematic review and meta analysis we compared the afs score faam sports score talar tilt anger anterior talar translation all of this there was no statistically significant difference between the suture tape augmentation as well as the modified rostrum repair but the most important finding of my study was the rate of the recurrence which was significantly lower in case of suture tape augmentation group as compared to the modified rostrum repair group so uh the recurrence of instability which i found in my study was less than 0.2% versus 8.6% in case of modified rostrum repair so some of the studies for example lee et al uh, has stated high uh, in high demand athletes a recurrence rate of 11% with modified rostrum repair petrat et al has uh, stated it to be as high as 6% following a modified rostrum repair secondly when i assess the return to sports there was no significant difference in the return to sports between the two groups but there is higher tegner activity as stated by porter et al in uh, augmented patients whereas uh, an interesting study by you et al uh, stated that at 12 weeks they assessed uh, the return to sports in 81% of the patient who were operated with a suture tape augmentation return to sports whereas 12% with broston repair only return to sports after 12 weeks so early return to sports is possible following this so I conclude that clinical and radiological outcomes using suture tape augmentation for ankle instability are excellent and are equivalent to standard broston repair but there is an evidence to suggest early return to sports and lower recurrences rate with suture tape augmentation thank you thank you go on go on vinay so shivam uh, a very nice presentation and very comprehensive so one question is uh, what uh, do you uh, have you seen any problem with your procedure 
uh, as compared to uh, the classic uh, Boston procedure? Any any problem that you anticipate in your technique? Because you are using two different modulus of elasticity. Right? You want some some movement, uh, but you are using fiber tape. Uh, as yes. Any problem? So uh, when when we when we initially were doing this procedure, we used to we had seen over tightening of the lateral side in one or two cases. So uh, for tightening, final tightening, we always now put the patient's ankle in neutral position as well as we put the uh, a support below the internal brace to prevent its over tightening. And since we have been using this technique, we prevent the over tightening. It just acts as a support. To the original repair. The problem with the brostrum is there is uh, uh, the patient comes so late there is the there is less of the remnant tissue that is available. I never use augmentation for my ACLs or any other ligament surgeries because we are already putting a, a ligament which is going to heal with the bone. But in this procedure we are going only do a pant over waist repair. We are just repairing the original tissue which was very very lax. So for its augmentation purpose, uh, we use uh, this procedure. And it is very early to say how long term the outcomes are. But uh, whatever studies are there are of, uh, have a follow up of three or five years. So uh, I mean, long term studies are required to see the uh, final outcome. There's a question in the chat box. Uh, what is the position of several lock for fibular site? So it is about two centimeters above the suture anchors, uh, and it in the in the center of the fibula. One question from my side. Yes, sir. Yeah, Shivam, very good presentation. I think you covered that very nicely. Good surgical demonstration. Doing the calculator osteotomy with that is fairly challenging. Um, there was I was hoping that there would have been a third arm. Now. I agree with you that those who come in acute and uh, the males have a good quality and I've never used an augment on them. Uh, is the females who come in late after one year, two years, you find very papery thin tissue there and then uh, even the uh, inferior retinaculum augment doesn't work on them. So I always use a biological augment there. And understanding that ligaments are viscoelastic structures. In fact, Lauren Lofaus has made this comment that Bankart is the only ligament in the body that you repair. All the rest you substitute, like ACL, you reconstruct, CC ligament, you reconstruct. So you bring another tissue there. So I've always used either the gracilis or the semi-T to augment that repair. So it's biological tissue. Yes, yes, uh, yes, being yes. viscoelastic and biological, uh, repetitive uh, cyclic loading is better tolerated by biological tissue. And in the nature of the ligament, when it fails, it's usually a plastic deformation. And that's why if you augment with biology, so I'm much in favor of biology, whether it's a CC ligament or the ankle. And that reinforces your study that some of them which are deficient. So touch wood, we haven't had a failure right now, but only 20% of our patients are athletes. The rest are just uh, sent patients. But that's another consideration you could take. Yes, sure. So, uh, Kia, sir, any question or we move ahead and uh, for the last talk? Probably we'll move ahead this way, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Dr. Karan, thank you so much, uh, Shivam. Uh, Dr. Karan, are you there? Yes. Uh, so you yeah. can uh, share your screen and start presentation. One second. Uh, good evening, uh, all the faculty and all the viewers on YouTube. So this topic is something which is not very common, but uh, there's something a little different from the typical loose body removal. That was a BMAC. That's why I thought I'll present this one. Uh, so the history is that <clears throat> a 34-year-old male presented with history of severe shoulder pain from two days only. And it was severe uh, major disability. And he also had a similar episode one year back with the result of local injection, probably a steroid. And prior to that, he was a regular gym goer, but he stopped it after that episode. On examination, he had minimal diffuse tenderness but with a severely restricted active abduction. Passive movements are still okay, but active movements are very poor. And there's severe weakness of the uh, protector cuff, especially supraspinatus. And this was the X-ray, which actually was a little unexpected. And uh, you know, sort of, in the mind, I was thinking of our uh, complete cuff tear, but this is what we saw on the X-ray. We got an MRI scan, which confirmed uh, severe chondromatosis. 
in the shoulder. So there are different views of the MRI and showing extensive osteochondromatosis, extending beyond just the capsule, but extending anteriorly, posteriorly also. And uh, the last view, you can see that there's one particular loose body, which is trapped in the joint. And that is probably the cause of the immediate uh, symptoms. We planned for the procedure. And during this MRI, we also had a doubt about the glenoid. It didn't look very good on the MRI in some views. So we also kept the BMAC as, an, uh, as a backup. And the procedure was a loose body removal. And we also planned for a BMAC, and which was required later on. And the BMAC was done with, we use a laparoscopy carbon dioxide insufflator so to achieve a good dry field. So that it can be an arthroscopic itself. And 60 ml of bone marrow was aspirated once we confirmed the glenoid bone loss, the cartilage loss, and total of 2 ml of BMAC was used. So this is one of the images which shows a video. It shows a removal. Uh, it was a very repeated and monotonous process. So multiple loose bodies had to be removed one by one. You can see that thanks to the suction flow, many of the loose bodies were coming close to the portal and make the removal a little easier. But uh, a lot of time was spent in removing all these loose bodies. And in this view, you can see that there's a lot of glenoid bone loss, the cartilage loss, sorry, which was there. It was not a very healthy cartilage. Even the humeral side was not a very healthy looking cartilage, but the glenoid was much worse. It was debrided. A lot of cartilage on the glenoid was uh, unhealthy and it was uh, debrided. Once you got a good healthy base for the BMAC, the next time we made multiple drill holes. So the BMAC stays in place much better. And the next step would be to have a dry field. Because the arthroscopy and the loose body removal took a lot of time, it took quite a lot of time for us to get the Feel dry. That use multiple dry gauze pieces to absorb all the fluid after insufflating with uh, carbon dioxide. So this took a lot of time, and uh, unfortunately because of that, the pen drive ran out of memory, and we could not even save it on the mobile phone. So with the permission of the moderators, I'll share a video of a similar BMAC in the knee joint, for which we had done a similar procedure, but uh, it is for the knee joint. Okay, so. And this is not the same patient, but a similar one. Where you achieve a first dry field. And then the fibrin glue with the bone marrow aspirate. And then a final layer of the BMAC. We had a lot of difficulty using the plastic needle, which the company we provided. So we had to use a use an 18 gauge needle, which gives much more control over the, how the BMAC is inserted. In the shoulder, it was an epidural needle that was used. The standard needles would not be long enough to reach it. So we had to use an epidural needle, and that gave us the reach and the BMAC was used for that. So very sorry about the fact that we did not have a video of the BMAC for the shoulder, but I hope this would give a good idea as to what was done. And the post operatively, its arm pouch was used, gentle exercise only. Active movements, including abduction, was started by about two weeks. And resumption of daily activities by three months, followed by intensive strengthening exercises by using resistance bands by three months. At one year follow up, he had full pain, uh, full function, no pain, but he was still a little apprehensive about resuming working out in the gym, but everything else was possible for him with no weakness of the rotor cuff. So, in the discussion, uh, just go a bit of theory. Not too much to discuss here because it is not a very common problem. There are very few case reports. Majority of the time, there's no identifiable etiology. It is an idiopathic condition. Sometimes there can be a secondary chondromatosis because of osteoarthritis, but that's very rare. 
and there are a few reports of associated instability or capsule laxity and sometimes it has also been noticed in various bursa not in the joint per se but in the subarachnoid bursa the problem is basically a benign metaplasia of the synovium which gets converted into cartilage which then may detach and form loose bodies which may also later on ossify the sizes can vary and the numbers can also vary quite often it can be asymptomatic but sometimes as in this particular patient there can be a mechanical symptom because of something equivalent to a locking episode x rays and mr are confirmatory and the procedure will obviously be requiring a removal of the loose bodies and in this case once we have one symptomatic loose body we have to remove all of them either open or arthroscopically and if there any other associated problem like in this situation it was a glenoid uh, cartilage loss it would require uh, uh, some treatment for that in this case was bmac uh there are not many studies regarding bmac in shoulder so well so far there are few articles i will mention those references later so primarily related to the chondromatosis and uh, case reports regarding that bmac in the shoulder something which is not very commonly done and what a few of them have been done so mainly injections into the rotator cuff for cuff arthropathy or tend sorry uh, tendinopathy of the rotator cuff or a tear during repair of the tear so you augment the or you try to speed up the process of repair of a uh, rotator cuff tear at the end of the surgery by augmenting with a fibrin glue with bmac but majority of times for minor tendinitis people use a uh, direct injection to the subacromial space of the uh, bmac injection to the subacromial space ongoing clinical trial of a similar opd basis injection into the subacromial space for primary osteoarthritis of shoulder for bmac and prt both but these are only uh, how do you call it it's a report not directly related to this condition whereas what we have done is something which is not uh, comparable to these uh, reports so as of now there's not uh, you could not find any literature online about any fibrin glue being used for cartilage loss in shoulder okay where the fibrin glue with bmac was used there are few references for both the chondromatosis and for the bmac in the shoulder so any questions uh, excellent excellent good good karan uh, nice presentation of the rare, rare cases and uh, how you managed it uh, what is the follow up of this patient uh, this is one year follow up one year yeah what, were, was there any recurrence of um, chondromatosis no there was uh, no we didn't get an mri done okay we got an x ray done that's what i want no to ask you to... yeah no yes. no another thing i want to ask you how do you um, assess the progress so his progress uh, mainly was clinical he had zero clinical. symptoms okay so that was a, the main initial assessment and actually we had asked him to get an mri done but he's not come back so he had come back uh, for the one year follow up about 3 uh, weeks or 4 weeks ago we got an x ray done that day which showed no osteochondromatosis i had asked for an mm -hmm. mri scan done but uh, he said he'll do it later and come back he has not turned up after that so he's waiting okay. for that now i am thinking about uh, regeneration of the, the cartilage Yes. probably you need a repeat uh, arthroscopy isn't it yeah uh, then there is a question that docs okay go on no no need plan for repeat arthroscopy to the cartilage yeah okay so considering Vinay? the extent involvement yeah. would you consider this from dr jaya venkatesh so considering the extensive involvement did you consider adjuvant radiotherapy to prevent recurrence in this case uh, recurrence mm -hmm. can be up to 20% as been quoted by literature so yes, Did you consider some adjuvant radiotherapy? No, no, not at all. The thought never crossed our minds. Okay, because you are uh, trying some uh, regenerative procedure, and then radiotherapy is a contraindication kind of thing. So, okay, great. So, uh, Doctor Manish Jangir has asked, uh, which position do you prefer if there is a com combined glenoid and humeral cartilage loss, B chair versus lateral position? So, this was done in the B chair position, and uh, the main reason for that is the Fact that we have to harvest the BMAC from the iliac crest. And this question is for Dr. Ashish, I think. Yes, um, I think um, the synovial chondromatosis will lead to cartilage loss, not a bone loss. Um, yes. So when I have a significant glenoid bone loss, uh, my preference is going to be an arthrolatage. So I'm going to do it beach chair position. In which case, the remplissage is irrelevant because I never do a remplissage with that. Uh, but if i'm going to do a bank card with remplissage then i would my preferred position is lateral okay so uh, shivam there is a question for you dr manish jangir 
what about yes. the calcaneo fibular ligament repair or augmentation uh, in view of talar tilt in stress x ray yes so if there is a cfl tear we usually uh, reconstruct it for so the anchor position changes uh, in this situation so what happens is that uh, uh, the two anchors which you place in fibula uh, come a bit anterior second is the nautilus anchor that we place in the second anchor that is the nautilus anchor comes superior and anterior in the fibula and the fiber tape is uh, and another nautilus anchor is inserted into the calcaneum to reconstruct the cfl ligament now the uh, point is that while uh, reconstructing the cfl what happens is the nautilus anchor sometimes goes into the subtalar joint so while drilling into the calcaneum you don't have to go from lateral to medial you have to be a bit oblique uh, a bit anterior to posterior and then put a, another nautilus anchor along with the fiber tape same fiber tape can be utilized in a triangular fashion you can reconstruct the cfl as well but the problem comes uh, with the nautilus anchor impinging into the subtalar joint so you have to be very careful to po uh, with positioning the nautilus anchor into the calcaneum so that's how you can construct reconstruct the cfl along with the atfl nautilus anchor in the fibula bit anterior and a nautilus anchor another nautilus anchor into the calcaneum yes uh, i have a question to ashish sir sir yes namakanthi uh, sir so do, yes. uh, do you use uh, bmac or any other biologics sir? because um, yeah uh, in ganga hospital we don't uh, use it because we don't believe in bmac or any other biologics none of our patients so what is your take on that sir so i was going to refer to karan uh, for this um, we don't use the one stage procedure i have a fair extensive use of last 10 years we do the aci technique the condron and it's a two stage so you harvest the cartilage send it to the lab a month later get about 16 million chondrocytes and then implant them um, none of our synovial contributions has recurred we've had one patient whom we operated on the right side and he did well and then he came back much later for the opposite side synovial chondromatosis uh, so that was a 10 year follow up between the two uh, my recommendation current is the two stage procedure chondrocytes are robust number one number two all our aci patients will undergo a repeat mri after one year because the integration of the chondrocytes is not guaranteed so you get between 80 to 90% integration our biggest patient has been a 90% humeral head bone loss because of uh, proud metal anchors and he had a 90% integration of a 50 mm defect on the humerus but he lasted for 7 8 years and then everything is worn out again so cartilage is not a permanent solution you need to keep a close eye on that this patient we've done a repeat scopy just the one out of our 15 patients we've done a repeat scopy to confirm beautiful arthroscopic images but it's impractical i don't think patients will agree to come back for a repeat arthroscopy uh one nice tip for you karan is when your synovial chondromatosis is 5 or 10 fragments it's very easy to go and pick them up individually not easy but when they go in the axillary pouch it's very tedious you have to push them out but when you have 100 inside just use a large suction cannula put it in there and it will suck out all of them very easily except for the large ones and then the remaining four or five large ones you can so we've had patient who the entire suction tube was full of synovial chondromatosis but it just saves you a lot of time to remove them in that manner many of them did come out with the suction not much effort was required correct uh, correct natural flow of fluid is just pulling the yeah uh, loose yeah. bodies towards the correct outflow ashish sir yeah so in view of uh, this pathological so uh, chondromatosis basically is a pathological synovial tissue so in view of a tissue which is pathological uh, are you attempting this repair of cartilage how sure are about uh, this uh, repair happening because ultimately the synovial tissue is pathological and you don't know how uh, in the near future the recurrence can happen and it can damage your uh, repair attempt of cartilage so how how do you go about this so the pathology is in the synovium there is a metaplasia in the synovium there is no pathology in the cartilage when the synovium forms these cartilage bits of various dimensions some are fibrous some are chondral when they get into the shoulder joint that is when they grind like you get these stone particles within your food which grind against your teeth 
a number of them are subcoracoid subacromial they are innocent so they don't cause any damage so when you have osteocartilage body is entering the shoulder joint and the patient comes in late then you have cartilage wear but the cartilage itself is not disease so it is inclement on us to repair the cartilage because these are young patients but 70 80% of our patients usually are come in with locking episodes you remove them before the cartilage damage happened or if it's a grade 1 grade 2 cartilage damage we leave them alone all you need to do is just debride all those loose bodies any other questions from the chat box vinay vinay yeah so i think uh, if there is no other question Yeah, uh, just one note, uh, Doctor Vinay. Uh, uh, Karan and uh, Shivam, uh, you can write up this and uh, give it to us in two to three days. So we'll publish it in uh, IAS newsletter. Uh, we also create the DOI, so so that will have the digital uh, 